This Sunday, Putin's warning. As the war moves to the east. Mariupol is in a dire situation to save them. We need uh, more weapons. And Ukraine sinks a key Russian warship. The U.S. announces a new $800 million weapons package. President Biden has said repeatedly that we don't bluff. But Ukraine's President Zelensky says his country still needs more. We need it sooner. We need it now. Is it enough? We don't think so. Russia retaliates and warns the U.S. directly of unpredictable consequences. None of us can take lightly um, the threat posed by a potential resort to, to tactical nuclear weapons. What does it all mean for the U.S. and European response? He believes he is winning the war. My guest this morning, Austrian Chancellor Karl Nehammer, the very first European leader to sit down face to face with Vladimir Putin since the Russian invasion began. Plus, COVID's new phase. The virus is going to be with us for a very long time, probably forever. With cases up but hospitalization still low, what will new Omicron subvariants mean for mass mandates? You're ready for the mandate to be over? Uh, a year ago. I'll talk to the administration's new COVID response coordinator, Dr. Ashish Jha. And who's part? We first have to defeat the rhinos and grandstanders in the primers. Another Trump impeacher announces he is leaving Congress. Some of the folks here are so beholden to Trump that they don't accept those of us that are willing to stand up. I'll sit down with Republican Congressman Fred Upton of Michigan. Joining me for insight and analysis are PBS NewsHour Chief Correspondent Amna Nawaz, Politico Playbook co-author Eugene Daniels, Matthew Continetti of the American Enterprise Institute, and Ruth Marcus, Deputy Editorial Page Editor for The Washington Post. Welcome to Sunday. It's Meet the Press. From NBC News in Washington, the longest running show in television history, this is Meet the Press with Chuck Todd. Good Sunday morning. Happy Easter and happy Passover. In Kiev and across the country, between air raid sirens and emergency cur curfews, Ukrainian Jews gathered with their families this weekend for Passover seders, refugees celebrated across Europe having to say next year in Ukraine. This morning at St. Peter's Square, the Pope said the world is marking an Easter of war, with Ukraine dragged into a cruel and senseless conflict. And there were processions through Lviv this morning as Ukrainians marked Palm Sunday. Orthodox Easter is celebrated next week. But overnight explosions rattled Kyiv and Kharkiv, missile strikes in retaliation after Ukrainian missiles sunk the flagship of Russia's fleet in the Black Sea. Real humiliating loss for the Russians. Now Russia is consolidating its forces in the east, staging attack helicopters at Ukraine's eastern border and sending new soldiers and artillery for a long campaign. The governor of the Donetsk region says Mariupol has been wiped off the face of the earth by Russian forces. And Russia is warning of unpredictable consequences directly to the United States through diplomatic channels if the United States and NATO continue to arm Ukraine. What is that a pretext for? All of this after the United States announced a new $800 million aid package that includes helicopters, javelin missiles, and for the first time, much heavier artillery. But President Zelensky is still asking for more. In fact, he said this, when some leaders ask me what weapons I need, I need a moment to calm myself because... I already told them the week before. It's Groundhog Day. NBC News foreign correspondent Matt Bradley is in Bucha this morning. And Matt, uh, we thought this region was somewhat safe. And then overnight, cruise missiles hit Kiev. What have you seen? What have you heard? Yeah, I mean, we're talking about cruise missiles that are landing outside of the capital city. And, you know, this city still is kind of lurching back to life, despite some glimpses of the fighting still going on. Uh, the, the mayor of Kiev just sort of shortened the curfew that had been in place for several weeks by a couple of hours, just as an indicator that things are kind of getting back to normal, despite constantly hearing air raid sirens and the continued shelling outside the city. I'm outside of Kiev right now. And as you can see, they're cleaning things up. I'm in something of a graveyard myself, but this one is for vehicles. If you can see just over my right shoulder here, Chuck, these are some of the Russian tanks that were recovered from the battlefield here in Bucha, totally burned out. But in front of me here are some of these civilian cars. The rest of these vehicles are for civilians. And, you know, a lot of this, you're seeing signs of you know, surrender. This is a white flag. And we're seeing this over and over and over again, Chuck. White flags tied to cars 
that have been riddled with bullet holes, and in this case, it looks like shrapnel holes. Something, a large munition blew up right here and clearly sprayed this car with shrapnel. This handwritten sign right here, it says Dieti. That means children. And we're seeing the same thing on this car here. A lot of these vehicles are going to be figuring into investigations into war crimes in the mm -hmm. coming weeks and months. Chuck? An important crime scene uh, that Matt Bradley is at right now. Matt, thank you. This week, Austrian Chancellor Karl Nehammer became the first European leader to sit down in person with Vladimir Putin since the Russian invasion began. Austria is one of six EU countries that are not in NATO, and it, the country is facing questions about the official neutrality it has maintained since the Second World War. Earlier, I spoke with the Chancellor and asked him about that Putin visit. You decided to visit Bucha before you went to the Kremlin, and you had said you wanted to be a first-hand witness and confront Mr. Putin by what you saw. Tell me what you told him. Well, um, you know, I took the decision to visit first Ukraine and uh, to meet President Zelensky, the Prime Minister, the Defense Minister, and the Vice Prime Minister. And um, they showed us also Bucha, and uh, we saw the war crimes there. And Orthodox priests told us Russian soldiers shot the civilians. And after the trip to the Ukraine, um, I did a trip to Moscow mm -hmm. to confront President Putin with that what I saw. Uh, you know, it was not a, a friendly conversation. It was right. a frank and tough conversation. And um, I told him what I saw. I saw the war crimes. I saw the massive loss of the Russian army. And I told him that there is a need for humanitarian corridors for cities like Mariupol or Haki, for example, the civilians need water and uh, we have to take care of the wounded, of the wounded there. And what was his reaction? You call, you, ba you accused him of, of his soldiers of committing war crimes. What was his reaction? He told me that he will cooperate with an international investigation on the one hand. And on the other hand, he told me that he uh, doesn't trust the Western world. Um, so... This will be the problem now in the future. I think international justice, the United Nations, an international investigation is necessary. And so it was a tough discussion between each other. But um, I tried to convince him that, for example, the former Yugoslavian war showed us that uh, international investigation is useful to prosecute the war criminals. You came away pretty pessimistic. Uh, why? You know, we all can see that there is uh, um, the preparation of a massive battle in the Donbas region. The Ukrainian side, uh, Ukrainian side is prepared for that. Uh, the, the Russians prepare for that. And uh, we will see many losses of human lives there. And um, so this is the reason why I'm pessimistic on the one hand. On the other hand, both sides, President Zelensky, I uh, talked with President Zelensky about uh, the trip to Moscow um, and uh, both sides, so President Zelensky and President Putin mentioned the international, the Istanbul peace talks. And uh, maybe we have a little chance mm -hmm. there um, for peace and also informed about that uh, president uh, or the president of Turkey, President Erdogan. Right. Do you get the sense that Vladimir Putin... Uh, uh, is viewing reality and ha what's happening in Ukraine, or is he getting uh, a dressed-up picture of the war? No, I think he is now in his own war logic. You know, um, he thinks the war is necessary for uh, security guarantees for the Russian Federation. He doesn't trust the international community. He blames the Ukrainians um, to, for uh, genocide, uh, genocide in uh, the Donbas region. So, um, well, um, he is now in his world, but I think he knows what is going on now in Ukraine. When you heard our CIA director talk publicly about the concerns that when Putin is cornered, he might do something like use a tactical nuclear weapon the person you sat down with, do you think that's a person that might use a nuclear weapon? 
It's a tough question. I think um, he knows that he has this weapon and he knows the threat of this weapon. So um, I don't know if he really use it, mm -hmm. but he knows that he can threat the world with these weapons. Does, does he believe he's winning the war or losing the war? No, I think he, he believes he is winning the war. Did he give a rationale? I mean, did he explain what makes it seem as if things are going better than what it looks like to the rest of us? No, uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I couldn't say that. Um, you know, um, he sent me clear messages um, uh, about his concerns. Yeah. Um, but, I sh but I think what is necessary to, to confront him all the time with that what is going on in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. I think this is necessary. Um, you know, at the end of our talks, he told me in German, um, it's better the war ends earlier than later. So I think he knows exactly what's going on now. I want to talk about additional punishments by the European Union, of which Austria is a member of. You have said you want sanctions that punish Russia and don't punish Europeans. Obviously, this has to do with the oil and gas issue. You're mm -hmm. very reliant on Russian gas. How quickly yeah. could Austria cut itself off from Russia without, without uh, having an economic uh, catastrophe? I mean, we do it already, um, but it uh, will take time because our dependency on Russian gas is 80 percent. Um, it's a similar situation uh, to the Republic of Germany. Um, and uh, our industry and our private households um, need the gas. So now we try everything um, to get independent, but it is not possible today, tomorrow, but maybe in a few years, we are independent from Russian gas. Austria's uh, neutrality, it's written into your constitution. Obviously, mm. as a member of the EU, you have some protections of NATO nations if something were to happen to you. Given what you've seen the Russians do in Ukraine, I'm guessing it's hard for you to be neutral in this war. You're against this war. Do you feel the need to want to help Ukraine more? Well, you know, um, first of all, the Austrian neutrality is deeply rooted in the Austrian history. Mm -hmm. So there in Austria, there's no discussion about the neutrality. But we are neutral in a military way. We are not neutral if we see that we have to help to show solidarity, to help, and uh, that we do. Would you like to see Ukraine become a member of the EU? Would you support that? Well, well, I say, I said it also to President Zelensky and to the Prime Minister. I think the first step is that Ukraine needs uh, fast and tough help, uh, like on a new plan how to rebuild mm -hmm. Ukraine with the United States, with the United Kingdom, with the European Union. And afterwards, uh, this, this is finished. There can be strong talks about um, membership in the European Union. But first things first. And first, we have to help to rebuild Ukraine. Carl Nehammer, the Chancellor of Austria, really appreciate you taking a few minutes during this holiday weekend uh, to talk with us. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We're going to discuss the Ukraine situation more a bit later in the show. But now we turn to the COVID-19 pandemic. It's entering a new phase, driven by fear, uncertainty, and Apathy. In Europe and in New York, new highly transmissible versions of the Omicron variant are on the rise. Philadelphia announced it is reinstating an indoor mask mandate. And the CDC announced masks will continue to be required on commercial flights until at least May 3rd. But hospitalizations are at their lowest point since the pandemic began. Just 1,464 new daily hospital admissions this week compared to a seven-day average of more than 21,000 in January. Cases have ticked up across the United States over the past week. Take a look at where they were in January. They were at more than 800,000. So this is a different picture right now. Across the country, though, differences in how states test are actually raising questions about whether case counts are an ac accurate metric. Just in this last week, California tested more than 1,400 people out of every 100,000. New Jersey tested just 47 out of every 100,000. So joining me now is the new White House COVID-19 response coordinator, Dr. Ashish Jha. Dr. Jha, welcome to Meet the Press, sir. Good morning. Thanks for having me here. Talking. Yeah, I'm no longer asking you opinions. I'm uh, asking you about policy here. So let me start with the current state of the pandemic. Uh, are we in the middle of a new surge? 
Yeah, so first of all, as you pointed out, Chuck, um, really important to take that bigger picture perspective. We are in a much, much better place than we have been for the last uh, two years. Certainly way better than we were in January, right? And that's really good. Um, cases are ticking up, and we're going to want to watch this carefully. Uh, it's, all, it's being driven primarily by BA2, this highly contagious variant of Omicron. Um, you know, so far, as you said, hospitalizations are largely flat, maybe inching up a little in a few places. Um, we're going to have to pay very close attention to this and see where this goes. Are you safe from these subvariants if you've been vaccinated? Yeah, the good news is our vaccines are holding up really well against BA2, against all of the Omicron variants, especially if you've been boosted. So the key here is you got to have the initial two shots and then you got to have a booster. That's what's really protecting people at this moment. So let me ask specifically about the Philadelphia decision. And I know you believe, look, local officials should make local decisions. I get all that. But are they using the right metric? Is the case count the correct metric? I mean, I just showed you right across the way from Philadelphia, New Jersey, you know, we don't have an accurate picture of the case count in New Jersey. Does Philadelphia and did they have an accurate enough one to make a decision like this? Yeah, it's a great question. So if you look at the CDC guidance, and by the way, something I've been enormously supportive of well before I came into my current role, um, the CDC guidance says basically three things should go into these kinds of decisions. Case count, certainly one of them. Hospitalization levels is another. And then hospital capacity is a third. You should be using all of those. That said, I think so that's a good framework for local officials. That said, you know, local officials do have a lot of local knowledge of where is it spreading, in which communities. Uh, they're using other types of data. So I have been really supportive of local uh, people making, local leaders making local decisions, mayors and governors, and I continue to be supportive. I think that's the right way to go. Are you concerned, though, if you do something like this based on a case count, not on hospitalizations, that it, it, it's sort of a, as uh, I believe um, one of the doctors uh, that the Washington Post regularly has a columnist uh, for, uh, Dr. Wen, I think she said, y you risk a crying wolf situation. Yeah, look, you know, how you communicate these kinds of decisions to your community is an enormous challenge that, that all local and, and, and federal leaders face, right? Uh, that is always important. And the question is, are the leaders in Philadelphia and other cities making decisions based on what they think is the best interest of people there? Uh, I think they are. I think in general, that's what most of our political leaders are doing. They're trying to get the, this right. And they've got to figure out how to communicate that in a way that uh, people understand. When cases are going up, uh, you know, they're going to look at their own local communities, figure out which, where is it spreading, and make those decisions. And I don't think it's important. I don't think it's useful for those of us sitting in Washington right. to second guess those decisions. Well, speaking of a Washington decision, the federal transportation mask mandate is something that's a Washington decision whether on airplanes or another federally uh, funded public transportation. What metric are you looking at for this decision on May 3rd? Yeah, so first and foremost, this is a CDC decision, right? And the CDC scientists, what they laid out was they said, look, we need 15 more days. And the reason we need 15 more days is that cases are rising. We want to see, is this going to translate into more severe disease, more hospitalizations, more deaths? Uh, that's why they asked. I think in 15 days, we'll have a lot more information. And then they are going to make a decision. They're going to make a recommendation based on uh, their assessment of the science. So you were an advocate of a vaccine mandate uh, when you were on the other side of, uh, of this uh, uh, in your private capacity here. Is that something that can be implemented, a vaccine mandate for air travel? Um, that's a really good question. I mean, I think, you know, when I was, uh, I have always believed, and certainly in the early days of the pandemic, uh, once vaccines became available, I thought it was very important to get as many Americans vaccinated as quickly as possible. And mandates worked. Uh, mandates do work. Um, we are in a different position now, obviously, with more than 220 million Americans vaccinated, 100 million people boosted. Uh, and so we really have to ask ourselves, what is the role of mandates moving forward? And we're going to need to assess each of these uh, individual situations differently. The, uh, it, it, would it be easier for the airlines to manage a vaccine mandate than a mask mandate? Well, that's a very good question, I think, ultimately for, uh, for the airlines. I think the decision that the CDC is facing right now is do we extend that mask mandate uh, moving forward? And that really has to be driven, I think, by the broader national situation, mm -hmm. cases, hospitalizations, deaths, what's happening with the, with the state of the pandemic. All right, a couple of vaccine questions. First, we still don't have a vaccine for essentially uh, birth to five. Uh, is that, are we basically not out of the potentially mask mandate world uh, or even voluntary masks, if you will, until we figure out how to get folks under five vaccinated. 
Yeah, great question. I, first of all, I think we should uh, let science and evidence drive when we're ready to get kids under five vaccinated. Uh, Moderna has uh, has put out its press release. They're going to be submitting the full set of data to the FDA, hopefully reasonably soon. I know Pfizer is working mm-hmm. on this. So we're going to have a lot more information. I don't think we need to tie that to broader uh, mass mandates. I think right. these are two separate issues, and I think we should keep them separate. Uh, the boosters. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll admit my own doctor seems to have some confusion. Is the CDC recommending it for everybody 50 plus or just approving it for 50 plus? Consult your physician. Yeah. So first of all, on boosters, let's be very clear on one thing, Chuck, which is everybody needs that third shot, the first booster. Every adult needs one. Uh, there is overwhelming evidence that that's the best way to protect yourself, both against infection, but much more importantly, against severe disease. On the second booster, on the second booster, the data out of Israel is pretty compelling that people over 60 who got a second booster after four months after their first booster saw not just a reduction in infections, but a reduction in deaths. Mm-hmm. So I think that's what really prompted both FDA and CDC. So- um, I think what, so why, I have elderly parents, 60, I have recommended 50? I mean, I'm just curious. Why, why didn't, if 60 well, is where the science is, why did we lower it to 50? Well, two sets of things. So the, the Israeli data is 60 and above. There are a lot of people in the 50s, especially if you have chronic disease, who are at high risk. So in my mind, as I read the evidence, uh, people over 60, I think, should be getting that booster. Again, that evidence is pretty compelling. 50 to 59, you're certainly eligible. Depends on your risk profile. That's a place where I think it's really important to talk to your doctor. Dr. Ashish Jha, uh, welcome to the government, uh, as they say. I appreciate you coming on uh, and sharing the administration's perspective on this. Thank you, sir. When we come back, the Republican Party is campaigning to take back the majority in Congress. Will it be a functioning majority party if all of its governing pragmatists are purged? Retiring Republican Congressman Fred Upton joins me next. Welcome back. Last week, Michigan Congressman Fred Upton, one of 10 House Republicans who voted to impeach Donald Trump, became the fourth to announce that he's going to retire. Five more are being primaried from the right by candidates Trump has endorsed. California's David Valadeo is the only exception so far. After Upton announced his retirement, Trump released this statement, writing, Upton quits, four down, six to go. Congressman Fred Upton joins me now. Fred, good to see you. Nice to see you always. Uh, Let me start with what you told my colleague, Vaughn Hilliard. You said, this is on March 30th, not that long ago, you said that the possibility of the perception of giving Trump a win by retiring was actually a motivator to run again. And yet, you're you're deciding not to run. Did you give Trump a win? Uh, No, we didn't. I don't think we did. No, it would have been a doozy of a campaign. I would have loved it. Uh, I like campaigns. (laughs) I really you do. wanted Trump like, involved. You were ready to take him I was him on? ready to go, but okay. the the final straw was they redrew the district. So my hometown, my home community, faces Lake Michigan. I can actually see it across the street where I live. It's a lot of it now is with Lake Erie. So it's literally 250 miles away. Uh, about 350 thousand different voters than I had before, and so. But that was the final. When you the test judges drove the campaign, though, you you paid for some TV uh, advertising. Yep, we were you ready. You did seem to test we drive were, it. We were did, ready. Did you travel this new district? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. No, I did, and we would have been welcomed in a, in a lot of different places. But we would have had to raise, I don't know, five six million bucks, mm-hmm. a couple months. I I could have done that, but at the end, uh, you know, it's time for family. I got three grandkids now. One of them is actually saying, "There's Papa. He's two years old. He's watching right now." <laughs> uh. I am curious what you think is going to happen to a Republican-controlled Congress next year. Don Bacon, who's a colleague of yep. yours, he's a Republican from Omaha, he, he said this, we can't have this mindset of burn the house down. We've got to be a governing party when we're in the majority, so we need people like Upton and folks like that, so other people have to step up. Uh, look, you regularly vote to keep the government open, and you're usually in the minority, and I believe the last time the debt ceiling was raised, I think now there's only going to be 33 members left. Maybe even less. Uh, who voted for it left in Congress. I mean, uh, do you fear we're going to def- that these House, this next House Republican majority could lead us to default? Well, a lot depends upon what happens in November. Uh, I do believe that the House is going to flip. In fact, I talked to Charlie Cook earlier this morning, and uh, he, I think he believes that as well. The math is hard to overcome. What is going to be the margin, though? Is it going to be better than Pelosi? I think it will a little bit better than what it is today for, for her. Yeah. Uh, but I don't think it's going to be this wild swing, knowing that we picked up a lot of seats in the last election despite Biden winning. So, 
you know, what's the over-under? Uh, so that's, that's going to make a big determination. So a small majority, does that make it more likely if it's a smaller trouble. Republican majority? Yeah. And you think that's trouble. more trouble? More trouble. Which is why then the Problem Solvers Caucus, I'm one of the vice chairs mm-hmm. there, is so important as we try to have some glue or fabric to really move forward on issues that we got to deal with, whether it be immigration, whether it be energy, whether it be inflation, all those different, and death ceiling obviously is going to be an early, early test in the next Congress. You got death threats for voting for infrastructure spending. I did. You played these voicemails. We <laughs> played these voicemails. No, I, in some ways it is, yeah, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, well, I mean, it, it made it easier to say, I'm out. Yeah, well, death threats, I mean, they never were like we had this this last year, but it was pretty crazy. And remember, that was a Republican bill. I mean, literally a year ago, this week, yeah. Governor Hogan brought a bunch of us up to his place in Annapolis. Republicans, Democrats, senators, governors, House members, both sides of the aisle. Mm. We defined what infrastructure ought to be, and we decided how to pay for it. And it passed 69 to 30 in the Senate. It was the issue all last summer. Lindsey Graham, Trump's best friend, voted for it. So if you're getting death threats, what's the likelihood of somebody watching what happened to you and going, yeah, I, I, I forget it. I'm not going to yeah, vote. Yeah, you know what? It's going to be a detriment getting good people. Uh, to run. It really will be because I got a school board member that lives on my street. I think he got death threats too just over the, the mask mandate. So we, we, we have a story out of Georgia where they can't find anybody to be the elections person in Fulton County. Yeah, because oh, I threats. believe it. I believe it. It's, you know, it's, it puts you at risk, particularly when they threaten not only you, and I'm, I like to think I'm pretty fast, but mm-hmm. when they threaten your spouse or your kids or, or whatever, that's what really makes it frightening. Um, let me ask about if the Republicans are going to run on anything, and I'm curious what you would have done. Uh, well, Kevin McCarthy says that the Republicans should run on an agenda this yeah, cycle. Yeah, I think they should. All right, here's what Mitch McConnell said. If Republicans take back control of Congress after the midterms, what would be your agenda? That is a very good question. And I'll let you know when we take it back. As a political strategist, it's probably the right call. It's a lot easier to win an election by running against somebody than being for anything. But isn't this what's wrong with our politics? Yeah, you have to be for something. And I think what Kevin has done, eight or nine different working groups and a whole bunch of different subjects, whether it be high tech or China or deficit or, you know, energy, is a good thing. And I was around. Remember, I was Newt's deputy whip, one of his deputy whips back in 94. Mm -hmm. That's when we came up with the contract with America. That was the huge effort. We didn't say we we're going to necessarily pass them, but it was going to be an agenda item for the next 100 days. I, I didn't actually vote for all of them, but I signed the contract that we ought to have a debate, and some of them became law. Can Kevin McCarthy uh, both represent you and Marjorie Taylor Greene? He can if he gets the margin. <laughs> That's why this over-under number is so important. Are yeah. we going to be over or under 230? If it's under 230... You don't think it, he's, it you think be, he may not become speaker if it's under 230. It will be right? very hard to govern for Republicans if we're under 230, knowing that we've got the MTG element that's uh, really not a part of a governing majority. We've had wild types of members of Congress since the history of this republic. Always have. Okay. But if you, can you... Do you remember Jim Traffigan? Oh, yeah. Look, beam me up. Yeah. <laughs> um, but Lauren Boebert. And Marjorie Taylor Greene and Paul Gosar, is that a different element than you've ever seen before? Um, I don't think we've had so as many folks in that sort of wing of the party mm-hmm. elected as we have before. But th- I think they're very popular back at home. Yeah. I mean, what, what does that tell you? She, about, I mean, she be, what does that tell you about the Republican Party? Troubled waters, I guess you could say. And that's why the margin is going to be so, you know, right now, look. Pelosi's got the votes, uh, particularly with the use of the proxy vote. She's not going to lose a vote. And I don't think she really has in uh, the mm-hmm. last year and a half. We're not going to have proxy votes. Kevin has made that very clear. None of us uh, want that to happen. Uh, and it was put in place really because of the COVID right. uh, issue. But a lot determines on what that level is going to be. And you'll be, I'll be watching you on uh, in November. I, I don't mean to throw it very quickly be. at you. You were just in the region of Ukraine. Let me just a simple question. Is the United States doing enough to help Ukraine? We have to do everything we can. Let me just tell you, the Ukraine folks, so brave, they are fighting for us. Yeah. It was a bipartisan trip that I went on. We have to make sure that they have every tool to make sure that they can survive. It sounds like you think we can do a little bit more. We can. Uh, Fred Upton, thanks for coming on. 
I, I may bug you more, even if you're retired. <laughs> when we come back, with the cost of living climbing, key parts of President Biden's political coalition is falling away. Is there any way out of his domestic malaise? Analyst next. Welcome back. Panelists here. PBS NewsHour Chief Correspondent Amna Nawaz, Politico Playbook co-author Eugene Daniels, Matthew Continetti of the American Enterprise Institute, and author of the new book, The Right. It's a fascinating book, actually. And Washington Post Deputy Editorial Page Editor Ruth Marcus. I say that as if I'm not used to books being fascinating. <laughs> I, I don't or mean it. Or books by me. Yeah. Or books by you. I'm still going to quote you, though. Yeah, you, you should. Put me on the back of the jacket. Uh, Eugene, I want to start with you because you had an interesting interview with uh, the president's pollster. And it sort of dovetails. I'm going to put up a couple of poll numbers here. It's really his overall job rating from our CNBC poll and the economic job rating. And the reason I single these two out is because they're converging. They're basically the same now. His overall job rating, I think, is being seen through the lens of the economy, pure and simple. No other issue is popping through. And then you had this Anzalone interview. What did what did Biden's pollster say? Yeah, he came on our, our our podcast, and you know he had a lot of interesting things to say. First and foremost, that this was the worst political environment he's seen in his thirty years, which you know is scary thing for a lot ninety four yeah, for the Democrats. Like we can go ten, yeah, exactly. fourteen. Yeah, but this is the worst environment, wow. and and you know there was a lot of the concerns that you hear from Democrats behind closed doors. They won't say it on the record or in front of cameras, but they do worry about how the economy is affecting how people think about um, how, what. They're going to do in the midterms. Mm-hmm. And I will say, he's, when you talk about whether or not the administration is able to pass the Build Back Better or call it what you want at this point, chunks right. of that, um, he said that if they're able to do that, they'll be able to break through. So if you touch health care, if you do something with the care economy, if you mm-hmm. do something with climate change, he thinks that that might be, that might work through. But that's hard to, to see happening at this point. Um, and there's one demographic group I want to single out, and it's voters under the age of 35 oh, yeah. who have never experienced inflation in their lifetime. As I say, they're used to life when, oh, there's a new gadget out. Well, in six months, it'll be cheaper, right. not more expensive. This is a whole different world. Yeah. Look at these numbers here. They think over uh, by a five-point margin greater. Right now, 82% of the public thinks the economy is only fair or poor. Adults under 35, it's 87%. Again, you want to buy a house for the first time, you're buying a higher interest rate than your parents have ever paid. Yeah. Uh, Never, never mind food and gas. This is a huge part of the Dem coalition. It's not great. It's not great. You're talking about one of the key groups that not only helped Democrats win back control of Congress, um, you know, propelled Biden into the White House, um, but are also going to be in play in larger numbers than ever before in the upcoming midterms, right? And the economy is front and center. When we talk about the economy, let's be specific, we're talking about inflation, we're talking about cost of living, because the White House will again point to things like unemployment being at record lows in 17 states, under 3% in 20 states, uh, wage growth uh, at the rate it's been. But Also, the fact that that wage growth is not keeping up with the cost of living, right? Right. So this generation, yeah, they stepped out into the world and were immediately hit with two back-to-back financial crises, right? You have the global financial crisis, then you have this related financial crisis from the pandemic, and things are not getting better. Even if you just go back a year, expectations were so high. Vaccines were coming out. Things were going to get back to, you know, back to normal. Their wages have been suppressed. They are forced into unemployment or underemployment, and they are pessimistic about the future. And Ruth, when America... As economy gets a cold, Nevada gets the flu. And, uh, and, and I want to show these Nevada numbers here because two incumbents, Democratic incumbent uh, Steve Sisolak, Democratic incumbent Senator uh, Catherine Cortez Masto, both were behind, trailing their potential uh, Republican opponents. There's still some primaries, still a lot of work to do there. But Nevada, when you look at the Nevada electorate, this is pieces of the coalition you see fraying away from Biden. Hispanic voters starting to, to, to peel away a little bit, uh, working class, uh, uh, non-college uh, educated whites. This is a problem, and Nevada may be the most acute. Um, in Nevada is a very acute problem, and it's an indicative problem that, the, as John Anselone said, Democrats are facing a very dire situation in November. And just to, to put some numbers on that, more than 7 in 10, 72 percent of Nevadans rated economic conditions fair or poor. This is a state that has gone for the Democratic candidate four 
times in a row for Democratic presidential mm -hmm. candidate. It's a state that Biden won. Um, so now his approval rating there is below the overall poll. It's at 35 percent. Right. And most scary and perhaps most ominous is the peeling off of Hispanic voters yep. in Nevada. Um, slump of approval rating from 73 percent a year ago to 52 percent now. You just read that if you're a Democratic um, candidate or pollster, you read it and gulp. Yeah. What is going on here? Yeah. And one of the biggest issues for Democrats is that they are talking about the things they've done, right? They've talked about the ARP, mm -hmm. COVID money, the child tax credit, talking about the infrastructure bill. But voters are thinking, OK, but what are you doing now? What, have, what are you doing now? for me lately? Well, and Anzalone said that, I, I, and the White House knows that. I think there was a big myth in both parties in Washington, D.C., that Hispanic voters are single-issue voters on the issue of immigration. Yeah. That is not true. Mm -hmm. Hispanic voters are American voters, mm -hmm. and they right. care about the same thing everybody else does. Right. How's the economy doing? How are your schools, and are your streets safe? Yeah. And it's that trifecta of issues that's powering the Republican wave this November. Yeah. And, are you, and are you representing me and my concerns? And so when Hispanic, vo Hispanic voters, Republicans have always said, and with good reason, that they are naturally Republican voters. They are, there's mm -hmm. a lot of um, social conservatism among the Hispanic voting bloc to the extent that Democrats are not echoing that and supporting um, the way that yeah. Hispanic voters think, they are just hurting themselves. It, you know, and the White House has to be more focused on Ukraine. I know they, they politically where they have to be focused, but they need to be. And you can make an argument that successfully getting an end to this war sooner rather than later can actually help the economy. Well, sure. I mean, the two issues are almost at odds, right? Because the longer that war goes on, the longer there's going to be food shortages, the longer there's going to be fuel prices going up. And we know, of course, we've seen in the data, yes, inflation had been going up even for several months before the, the war in Ukraine began. But we know a lot of that huge increase in inflation was because of the fuel price increase because of the mm -hmm. war. And so voters get that. I think people understand that. But when they're looking at who to blame in all of this, mm -hmm. most, most Americans do look at the pandemic and they say, OK, 69 percent of Americans say, I, I get it. That's why the economy is where it is. I think 55 percent blame Putin. But then 45 percent or so blame President Biden. Yeah. And they're not going to be voting against the pandemic and they're not right. going to be voting against Putin. They're going to have to decide about President you know, Biden. Gallup recently asked the public, what are your top concerns? Of course, economy and the cost of living was number one. Mm -hmm. Second, strikingly to me, was government and poor leadership. Mm -hmm. So other presidents have been able to recover from these sorts of uh, yeah. setbacks. But I think the public has judged Biden and judged him negatively, and it's going to be hard for him to change that perception no matter what happens. Well, as, as Anzalone will say, the one thing they hang their hat on is Reagan had a bad first <laughs> midterm, Clinton had a bad first midterm, right, and Obama had a bad first midterm. But things got yeah. better. Yeah. For those presidents, kind conditions of, got kind better. Of, kind of clinging to faint yeah. hopes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got to try really something, right? All right. Let me pause here when we come back. Two more coaches have added their names to the Brian Flores lawsuit against the NFL, alleging racial discrimination. The league is responding, but has it been enough? That's next. Welcome back. It has been 20 years since the NFL first instituted what's known as the Rooney Rule. It requires teams to interview at least one candidate of color for a head coaching job. There were three black head coaches, just three then. And today, there's still just three. Three of the league's 32 head coaches are black. In February, former Miami Dolphins head coach Brian Flores filed a class action lawsuit alleging racial discrimination after being fired. Two more coaches have signed on since. In a new report for our single topic show, Meet the Press Reports, my colleague Blaine Alexander takes a look at the troubled legacy of race and the NFL. In 2021, black players made up the vast majority of the National Football League, with more than two-thirds identifying as either African-American or mixed race. Yet, among coaches, it's a much different story. Currently, there are only three black head coaches in the entire league. And throughout the league's nearly 102-year history, only 25 black men have ever held that position. Among them, Tony Dungy. I think the basic question is, does the NFL have a race problem? We, we do have a problem. When you've got an organization that is 65 to 70 percent African-American on the field, but then you look in other portions of the business, the staffs, the coaching staffs, the front office, the support staffs, and it's not that. You, you have to question and say, well, what's going on here? 
In the last month, the NFL's league office has taken steps, announcing a new diversity committee to evaluate hiring practices. But, of course, it is the owners that eventually have to make these changes. You can see our entire Meet the Press Reports episode anytime on Peacock. When we come back, in anticipation of the Supreme Court's decision on Roe, states are proposing and passing a wave of new abortion laws. Stay with us. Welcome back. We've had quite a few changes in abortion law pretty much since the start of this year, both on the restrictive side in the states and on the legal side as well. Uh, look at this. We had some 40-plus uh, states uh, have in, had seen uh, more restrictive abortion laws introduced, and I believe we've had nine of them enacted. Eight of them had Republican governors, just one didn't, and that's Andy Bashir on the Democratic side. You had about 30 states that introduced bills to protect or expand abortion rights. You'll be shocked to know, Ruth, that all of those states had Democratic governors, <laughs> um, except for works. one, Larry Hogan, and guess what? Larry Hogan. His veto was overridden by a Democratic legislature, Andy Bashir on the other side, his veto uh, done on that. But we're all doing this, waiting for what happens by, uh, in June from the Supreme Court. What's going to happen in June? You tell me. <laughs> uh, it, in June is not good news for abortion rights, but what's really remarkable, I think, is the uh, energy, the jump the gun urge among um, conservative states and Republican state legislatures. Guys, you're going to win. It's only a question of how much you're going to win, how quickly. You can't even wait for the court? Apparently not. Um, we've had a situation in Texas where uh, what is now a constitutional right has been allowed not to take effect um, for almost all pregnant women since September. We now see in Kentucky for the first time effectively abortion is outlawed there because they have passed a law that it is impossible to comply with. It requires um, mm -hmm. uh, abortion clinics to have mechanisms to dispose of fetal remains, but that is simply not uh, possible. So abortion is outlawed by state legislatures and so far allowed by the courts even before the court acts. That's pretty remarkable. I want to play um, sort of from both sides of this debate how governors are messaging their decisions. Take a look. This will represent uh, the most significant protections for life that have been enacted in this state in a generation. Okay. The assault on women's privacy rights and bodily autonomy is no longer a theoretical risk. We want Oklahoma to be the most pro-life state in the country. Uh, we want to outlaw abortion in the state of Oklahoma. No matter what the Supreme Court does in the future, people, women in Colorado will be able to choose. You know, Matthew, it, I think a lot depends on, on how the Supreme Court rules on abortion, right? Because I think there is... If this is a debate about legal or not legal, Republicans might might have a bigger problem than if this is a debate about 15 weeks or, or 24 weeks. Yeah, a couple of things, Chuck, on this important issue. The, the pro-life movement has had two major goals since Roe v. Wade. One is to reverse Roe v. Wade. Mm -hmm. That seems like it could happen or come close to happening with a huge space for states to regulate abortion in June. The second goal is to ban abortion. Right. And that's the subject of the human life amendments that have been introduced throughout the history of the Roe era. That's a harder goal, mm -hmm. especially on a national level. And I think what we're seeing now on both the Republican and Democratic side is people preparing for the reintroduction of abortion law into the Democratic space. Yep. And I think that means that you're going to get extreme bills actually on both sides. Red state bills outlawing, outlawing abortion, blue state bills legalizing it all the way through the nine months of pregnancy. What I, what's curious, I, I, I picked out Florida and Arizona, Eugene, because uh, they're battleground states. Yeah. And when it's about legality, it's a clear majority in favor of staying legal. Mm -hmm. It's when you start to get into the details that things change here. When you spoke to Anzalone, are they counting on a, on a row ruling that energizes them, these you know, midterms? Yes, and Democrats have been talking about this a little bit, is that they expect this to be something that sends people to the polls. The problem is, the depending on what the Supreme Court rules, you know, Roe seems like it's going to be rolled back at least a little bit. And so that's already going to happen. So there's no change that they can do other than to say, if you give us more Senate seats, if you give us more House seats, we can pass some type of federal law that allows abortion so we don't have to go through this route. Because what 
you know, that maps show, both of those maps, is that what we're going, we may have is a world in which there are two countries where you can go in one state and get an abortion and literally, a, you know, a, a mile away mm -hmm. cannot get an abortion. That's something that, you know. Well, Missouri's trying to figure out how to even prevent that. Exactly. Uh, exactly. For what it's worth. Uh, Amna. But that's what we've seen happen, right? Yeah. And in Texas is the perfect example. We already saw at the end of last year after that, I think it was a six-week ban in Texas mm -hmm. that private citizens were allowed to enforce, and that's how they avoided court mm -hmm. intervention. Thousands of women, thousands of women left the state to be able to go to other places to have those same kinds of abortion care services. And it's already, I mean, you don't need to pass an outright ban mm -hmm. to essentially limit and completely remove a woman's right to a legal or safe abortion. You just have to pass enough rules that clinics can no longer be in compliance to do it. Let me get, I want to get out of the specifics on the law and get to the culture war issue, left and right. Is a culture war midterm election to the benefit of the Democrats this cycle or the Republicans, Ruth? Well, it depends on which aspect of the culture war, which battle of the culture war you're going to fight. If you're going to fight about um, gay rights, about um, schools and things, I think it may end up being uh, a pro-Republican uh, mm -hmm. issue in, in certain states. Uh, if you're going to fight about abortion, uh, it's going to end up being in those perhaps same mm -hmm. states a pro-Democratic issue. However, it is really hard to see a culture war um, outcome determinative battle yeah. when you've got inflation at the state that it's say. at. Inflation will uh, overcome everything. After the Texas law was passed, I was among the conservatives saying this might have thrown a lifeline to Democrats in the off-year election. That didn't happen. Republicans did very well in the off-year election post-Texas law. Terry McAuliffe tried to use it And in right Virginia. now, yeah. Abbott is leading his bid for re-election. So that backlash yeah. has not happened. Again, I think we all wait for what the Supremes tell us in June. Uh, uh, I, look, I need to pause here for a minute. Before we go, I want to note the passing of a longtime friend and a colleague for a lot of us here in Washington and NBC, Wendy Rieger. She worked at News 4 here in Washington as a reporter and anchor for 33 years. We shared a bureau together for decades uh, with her. Wendy was diagnosed with brain cancer almost a year ago. Before death, in a note to her beloved newsroom, Wendy wrote this. As you know, I've lived my life big and loud. It is my nature, and I've had a blast. But a stillness has come over me that is profound and potent. I didn't know I could be this quiet. Life is not always a test. It is a teaching. I must learn this lesson with grace. And I will. Wendy Rieger was 65. That's all we have for today. Thanks for watching. Have a happy Easter and a happy Passover. We'll be back next week. Because if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Press Chuck Toddcast, free wherever you get your podcasts.